Well, good morning or evening as <laughs> wherever you are. Um, what I'd like to cover in this lecture is the way in which the Constitution of the United States unfolded after the Constitution was itself ratified. The general thesis is that while the constitutional revolution had been complete, um, we were independent from England and we'd established a form of government and created a people with uh, a distinct purpose that the Constitution was to help achieve. All of these things have been done the constitution was itself unfolding and there were all of these spaces in which constitutional meaning was unclear even though the text of the constitution had been finished um, although with the bill of rights we can again ask whether or not it's ever really finished um, so starting in 1789 much work remains to be done in creating um, or putting the constitution into practice um, the three branches of government have been created and distinguished. And it seems that both the Federalist and the Anti-Federalists agreed that these three branches of government ought to be um, carefully balanced against one another, but it wasn't clear where the executive ended and where the legislature began. There are specific instances in which we talk about president's power over foreign policy. Well, where does the president's power start and Congress's power stop? The right to make war, is that something that presidents possess? Is it something that kind of has to be initiated in the House of Representatives? And the constitutional texts, while they might be short and relatively clear, um, need some sort of precedent in order to be implemented. More than that, it's not at all clear what role political parties will play in this system. Um, while the politics of Republican Whiggery in the and small r, Republican Whiggery in the American Revolution would suggest that this is going to be a regime based on civic virtue and political parties will be unnecessary. If you look at Federalist 10 carefully, Madison suggests that faction must be made to counteract faction in this new regime. And so there might be a place for rather than kind of dissolving all kind of political preferences in the name of Republican virtue, um, parties might continue to have a role. They certainly had in Revolutionary War Pennsylvania, parties that pre-existed the Constitution. Um, and as groups, not just kind of in between the president and Congress, but as factions in Congress or factions within the president's cabinet disagreed over a whole host of issues about whether we should have a pro-French or pro-British foreign policy but whether there should be a bank of the United States, about whether presidents should have the right to remove people that they appoint. Um, as people disagree about the meaning of the Constitution, it wasn't clear who would have the final say in determining what constitutional meaning was. Um, this became even more complicated as swiftly court cases arose over whether or not the states or the federal government were in some sense finally sovereign. Um, and there was still lurking, although to be sure these questions didn't lurk for long, about whether the federal government was itself legitimate, about whether the Philadelphia Convention had been a secret conspiracy designed to kind of destroy the article. Um, it takes another decade to resolve these things. So what I think I'd like to do is to handle some of these issues in turn. Um, we'll start with judiciary issues we'll talk about the, we'll talk about the bill of rights first then we'll talk about the judiciary and the presidency and the creation of political factions and political parties we'll see how far we can get in the minutes that we have the bill of rights was something that emerged from the ratification process both uh, new york and massachusetts as well as virginia had insisted that the states suggested amendments to the Constitution should be made binding. However, the ratification of the Constitution was taken as permanent, um, accomplished by the ratification of the first nine states. And so Virginia's stipulations and New York stipulations weren't in any sense binding. And it seemed to many that as the Federalist Party um, assumed, participated in congressional elections, towards George Washington as their president, and um, 
created a functioning government in the summer of 1789, that maybe they ought to just kind of move along with the business of creating new branches of government, um, new, new, new kind of departments of the federal government. Um, and it to James Madison that we really owe the, the, the fact that we even have a Bill of Rights. Madison, frankly, made a pest of himself. Um, he kept getting up in congressional debate. He 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 promised his constituents in 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 Western Virginia, Central Western Virginia, that he would gain a Bill of Rights, um, and he used this to sort of fight for ratification of the Constitution. So when he arrived as a congressman in the House of Representatives in 1789 he felt himself duty bound to propose these things. And so he would stand up and kind of give a speech on how we need to create a bill of rights. And he would say, Madison, sit down. We need to create a judiciary. Or wouldn't it be nice to have a properly staffed secretary of war? Or we need a treasury department. Madison eventually at the end of the summer says like, I promised that I do this and I need to do this. So he proposes 17 amendments to the constitution um, with specific limitations on federal power. Now he doesn't propose sweeping revisions on um, kind of the structure of the separation of powers or weakening the presidency or the weakening the judiciary. He's not interested in that, but he does take what he thinks are the best anti-federalist ideas about limiting federal power and making sure that the federal government doesn't usurp the natural rights or natural liberties of the people. Of these 17, Congress passed 12. 10 of the amendments are what we would consider proper the Bill of Rights. Um, the first is designed to clearly prohibit a free, the establishment of religion, pro, prohibiting um, the free exercise of, guaranteeing rights of freedom, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Um, but if you read the amendment carefully, you'll notice that it starts with the words, Congress shall make no law. And this is precisely how the amendment was intended in the 1780s it was, and 90s and forward. So this doesn't limit the power of the states. Massachusetts has a religious establishment down to the 1820s. What it did do was limit the power of the federal government to deprive people of these rights. Um, the Second Amendment stipulated that uh, um, a well-regulated militia was necessary to American freedom and so the right to bear arms would be protected. Subsequent amendments prohibit the quartering of soldiers and private property. It guarantees freedom from unreasonable search and seizure. Um, it prohibits certain kind of specific warrants that you can only be arrested on a, a general warrant. No, it stipulates that, that you have to be arrested with a specific warrant, that um, the Congress couldn't give the federal marshals the general power to arrest people on whatever charges if the, if the circumstances demanded. So this, is, this was designed to protect most of the things that were really in um, the old Magna Carta that there was a due process of law that would be protected by guaranteeing the right to a jury trial, the right to confront one's accuser, it would prevent you from being tried in court for the same reason twice, it would give you just compensation if your property was seized, that would kind of set bail at a reasonable level. So the, all of these kind of the, the third through eighth amendments are intensely procedural in their, in their framing. They're less concerned with the kind of separation of powers issues that the anti-federalists raised, but they really were designed to create a specific set of liberties that the federal government couldn't mess with. Now, until the Civil War, it was widely assumed that the states could mess with these things if they, cho if they chose. So, and then there are two more amendments that are designed to sort of express the general frame of American constitutionalism. The ninth was that the powers that were enumerated are the powers that are granted to the federal government and the other rights are retained by the people. And the 10th amendment stipulates that, again, the powers that are not delegated are reserved to the states respectively or to the people, depending on what they are. And so these, th th that, that really is the anti-federalist idea that I was concluding class with, this idea that the constitution ought to be read with an eye towards limiting power and then ought to be the assumption that was baked into it. Now, this is really striking giving them, Madison himself was one of the architects of national power. He was a major proponent of it during the constitutional debates. Remember from your textbook that Madison actually suggested a veto power to the Constitution, um, the veto power to the federal government that it be given the right to veto legislation from the states. So this is quite a striking thing. It does enshrine in the federal government 
that one of the federal, one of the fundamental normative purposes of the federal government is this guarantee of rights to the people and to the states. Um, and that becomes so fundamental that it might be called a norm in and of itself. So um, the next thing I want to talk about, a sort of gray space that emerges from the Constitution, is the Judiciary Act of 1789. Remember, the, the big theme here is that the Constitution in 1789 is still un incomplete. It hasn't really properly been executed. Um, and it's not at all clear without these actions what the Constitution might have done. Um, remember, Hamilton's original argument in the Federalist Papers is that a Bill of Rights was unnecessary. It's implicit in the design. He says, you'll do more harm than good by creating it. So the Constitution is not finished when they, when they kind of engross the document and kind of have the states sign it in at the end of the convention, the Constitution is still sort of being implemented and still being completed. Um, you might even say it's still that way today. So the courts, what kind of court is required by the Constitution? Well, um, the, the Constitution stipulates that there will be a national judiciary, that it will be independent, that judges will have lifetime tenure or good behavior, and that there will be at the top a Supreme Court, a high level court um, that will oversee the lower tribunals and the, the work of the states. Um, now they chose to create within that stipulation a unique structure that we've since dispensed with. Like we don't, this isn't the way we have courts today. But they said that there would be district courts at the state level, and then the states would be organized into circuits. And on circuit, the, the members of the Supreme Court would ride, and they would go on like circuit riding preachers, they'd be circuit riding judges, and they would travel through these states and kind of administer justice then at the regional level, working together so you would have a district judge and a Supreme Court judge sitting together in circuit. Um, those cases could then be appealed to the Supreme Court, and it didn't at all stipulate, the Constitution doesn't stipulate how many members of the court there will be. Now, over time, we sort of accepted the fact that there are nine, although there were more than that, and then less than that during the Civil War. And then um, there were attempts during the New Deal for FDR to pack the court, but that was generally seen as violating the spirit of the Constitution, although not its text. So FDR attempted to argue that he wanted to implement a new kind of constitution in the depression and was and was rejected for it. There are um, aspects of this act, uh, act drafted by Oliver Ellsworth that are worth commenting on because they, they may have inadvertently created power in the federal government that the, the framers didn't intend. Um, so in addition to creating these circuit courts that we don't have today, Today, we have an appellate court that's staffed by its own unique set of judges, including today, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Judge Amy Coney Barrett is a member of an appellate court of appeals. But in the Judiciary Act, um, Section 13 granted that the court, the Supreme Court, would hear writs of mandamus or writs of appeal from either federal courts or federal officers, but in addition to that, that it grants to the Supreme Court original jurisdiction um, in a set of cases that actually the Constitution doesn't stipulate. The Constitution stipulates that the original jurisdiction really is only in cases involving different states. Um, it's certainly the court is the court is a court of appeal. It's not a court of original jurisdiction in, in, in most cases. And then in section 25 of the Judiciary Act, um, it gave the Supreme Court jurisdiction over state courts that made rulings on federal law. Um, but without this to execute this, frankly, the Supreme Court would be a much weaker institution than it, than it would under the Constitution. If section 25 were to be repealed, that would essentially mean that, that, that state courts that struck down federal laws, they would in fact for their state be the court of last appeal. And some critics of federal power have argued that, that this ought to be done. Perhaps most strikingly, um, 
they create a system of concurrent original jurisdiction so that a lot of times when a crime is committed, you have to decide whether or not you're going to kind of prosecute that crime at the state level or at the federal level. And if you start at the state level, then you have to take it all the way up to the state Supreme Court before it then starts to move into the federal system. Now, this is all pretty abstract, or not abstract, technical. One of the things that the Constitution itself doesn't stipulate at all is what the court's relationship to the political branches would be. Um, and initially, it seemed that, that George Washington hoped he could use the court as a sort of informal body of legal advisors. And so if a decision came before him that might be too hot for the attorney general to handle, that um, it would be possible to ask the court for their own particular opinion. In 1793, George Washington actually asked the Supreme Court for advice. Um, and um, the court refused it, flat out. They says that this request is a violation of the separation of powers and that their primary role is to only weigh in on constitutional meaning when they deal with a specific case. And this is the court sort of, this is a self-imposed limitation on their power. Um, now, most of the major courses, cases that you're responsible for are cases that date from the Marshall era. But you can see that under um, Chief Justice John Jay, whose picture you see here, the court begins to wrestle with these questions of their own jurisdiction very early in the process. And um, in the Habern case from 1792, um, Congress had given to the court the task of adjudicating the very thorny claims about civil war, not civil war, Revolutionary War pensions benefits. So the court creates a, sorry, Congress creates a law granting benefits to the, the veterans and just delegates to the courts the really thorny and messy issues of who's going to get pensions and who's not. And the court actually basically says, this has nothing to do with us. Um, you, you cannot make us into your own kind of adjudicators. If you want to give the job to executive bureaucrats, that's fine, but we're, we're not going to wade into these thorny questions. Um, this is not the judicial function. So again, the court here is sort of is, is imposing they're kind of filling in the gray space that the Constitution doesn't stipulate, essentially by self-limitation. Um, in Ware versus Heighton, um, this is a case generated by Virginia law. In the immediate aftermath of the revolution, Virginia had decided that its planter class, who were quite wealthy and politically powerful, didn't have to resume paying their debts to um, the British merchants and the, and the British bankers um, that in fact as a sovereign Virginia didn't have to pay they could they could suspend the payment of these debts um, well the court takes a really good view of this uh, the peace of Paris had clearly stipulated that debts would be um, you know that that private debt to British creditors was still in fact in force and that because the treaty had been made it was the supreme law of the land and um, Virginia just had to deal with it. Now these are these two are minor cases. The cases surrounding um, the Georgia land situation um, become epic and notorious. So this is the case of Chisholm v. Georgia, which which in some ways foreshadows the issues of the American Civil War. Now in the Chisholm case, a British creditor sued the state of Georgia to get confiscated property from the Revolutionary War era. Um, there, was a, there was a British um, merchant or banker who'd been promised land in payment of debts, and, um, but the land had then been confiscated during the war. And the question is, was that confiscation legitimate? Now, what's interesting about this case is that Georgia refuses to appear. They argue they are a sovereign state and as a sovereign state, they cannot be sued in federal court. And um, so they, they, re they actually refuse to defend themselves. And this is one of the first really hotly contested divided cases in the law. The majority opinion by Chief Justice John Jay 
said that the state government had to conform. By agreeing to the Constitution um, and ratifying it, they agreed to be bound by the Constitution. And to that extent, for these specific purposes, they're no longer sovereign. Um, Iridel actually writes a dissenting, not to say a concurring opinion, agreeing, but 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 kind of his his reasoning is quite different. So Iridel doesn't reason based on the fact that the federal government is itself sovereign. Iridel said, no, this, this ought to be decided by the common law, which does stipulate that a, um, a sovereign cannot be sued. And so this has in fact not been superseded. Just because something is in the text of the constitution does not mean it can be violated. And so this Iridel here kind of suggests that there's a higher law than constitutions themselves. You, ca you can't do something that's unconstitutional, even the federal government. Um, and so this is actually a dissent, Iridel sides with Georgia. Now this, this actually was quite a unclear theory in early federal law. Um, we've talked extensively about how the constitution draws on principles of the common law, but is all of British common law precedent still binding? And can it be used by the federal judiciary to either strike down federal law or strike down state law? This would make the federal judgment an enormous instrument of power. Um, and that, that debate isn't actually settled for another, I think, two and a half decades. Now, on the question, question of can a sovereign state be sued, the states collectively immediately freak out about this. And they order their, um, their, their legislatures then immediately draft resolutions and they send them to the other states. And it seems like there's a consensus on this. So Congress swiftly passes the 11th Amendment arguing that um, states can't be sued in court. And in fact, the 11th Amendment is still on the books, but crafty plaintiffs quickly discover that the way around this amendment is to just simply not sue the state itself. You sue Governor Cuomo, you sue the Secretary of State, you sue the Treasurer, you sue the Registrar, and so the 11th Amendment is one of these laws that I guess technically it's still on the force, but as the power of the federal government has grown, um, it's become less of a significant entity. Um, this is though, like on the, on, the, on the kind of broad question of who's gonna decide finally what the constitution means, Jay's opinion in Chisholm v. Georgia was not the final word on the constitution. The states had the final word, but they had the final word not by nullifying or interposing or developing a unique situation, they got the constitution changed. Um, and that's what the 11th amendment represented. Okay, so we'll talk a heck of a lot more about the judiciary later in the week when we examine the Marshall Court and in particular this idea of judicial review. You see in the Chisholm case that the idea of judicial review is not fully formed. Um, the states seem to think that they might be the court of last resort in setting constitutional meaning, and Congress maybe is going to create it. Okay, that's about the creation of the judiciary. Let's talk to about the creation of the executive branch. Um, the first Wednesday in March had been set for the presidential inauguration. Um, Unanimous votes are cast for John George Washington as president of the United States. Um, John Adams gets the second most votes for vice president, and so he becomes the vice president. Congress doesn't have enough people to even reach a quorum until April, and then they immediately begin the process of creating an executive branch. Now, these are all things that had been done by congressional committee before the Constitution of 1789. So issues of treasury, state, and war had been managed, but they'd been managed by congressional kind of subcommittees. And they, the thought was, was now we're gonna create a professional staff that's gonna do this within the executive department. Um, none of these things are in the Constitution. There's no Secretary of State in the Constitution. It could be abolished, even though it's a, probably one of the most important places in the American political system, it's not something that's required in the original text of the Constitution. So they start by kind of creating the Department of State or the Department of Foreign Affairs. And one of the things that Congress immediately notices is that it's clear that um, 
high level officials are going to be approved by the Senate. So there's a confirmation role. But the Constitution doesn't stipulate whether or not the Senate would have the power to remove a Secretary of State or whether they could only be removed with the will of the President. Um, and this is really crucial because this is the executive branch, like how dependent is it on Congress? And Congress can't agree on this and so they decide to just leave it alone. This will later become a major source of political war in the era of reconstruction when President Johnson attempts to remove cabinet officials and is impeached for it. Um, the next department that's created is the Department of the Treasury. Um, and the Treasury Department in this bill is ordered to report specifically to Congress on the state of the Treasury. Um, this implies a kind of ministerial government, that there are specific connections between these secretaries. And they're going to report back to Congress, maybe as the supreme leading branch, in much the same way that the Chancellor of the Exchequer in England really is a creature of, of, of Parliament. Um, this speaks to a broader issue that, that the whole cabinet system that's created um, doesn't actually exist in the Constitution. It doesn't even show up in statutory law until 1907. Um, the, the, the thought was that the, the president executes the law, but as Congress creates these positions, maybe they report directly to the Congress as opposed to reporting to the president. The cabinet system as it evolves was a heck of a lot less to the statutory precedent and a lot more to the attempts of Alexander Hamilton to create a system of government that would allow him ministerial potential. This is just my personal opinion. There are um, other branches that are eventually created. When the Judiciary Act is created, we finally get an attorney general. The post office isn't created until 1794. Um, it's unclear what the executive function is, even after all of these new positions are created, right? So the Constitution gives the president these specific powers, but then the question is, well, what do these powers mean? Um, the Constitution stipulates that from time to time, the president will deliver reports to the Congress on the State of the Union. Well, reports could mean anything. It could mean I'm going to send an email to Nancy Pelosi, and that might be doing my constitutional duty. George Washington adopted the practice of walking over to Congress and actually giving a speech on the State of the Union. Um, Jefferson dislikes this practice because he thinks it gets in the way of kind of the people's branch. So he discontinues it and it's not resumed again until Woodrow Wilson takes it up. One thing that's clearly an executive power is that the president has the right to veto legislation. Um, but it seems that Washington believed and subsequent presidents assumed, based on Washington's example, that this was a rare privilege that should only be used in cases where something unconstitutional was attempted. So the veto power was something like judicial review. It's that branch's attempt to say to the political branch, yeah, you've gone too far here. Washington's first veto isn't until 1791. Um, a particular apportionment bill had given some states more than one representative for every 30,000. This is a violation of the Constitution. Um, and so in this sense, he favors Jefferson, who um, Je Jefferson had thought that the people's representatives, um, no, never mind, never mind, yeah. So Washington strikes this down as an unconstitutional assumption of power by Congress, and it's it sticks. Adams then vetoes exactly zero pieces of legislation. Jefferson vetoes exactly zero pieces of legislation. So in contrast with today's presidency, the presidency, even under Washington, is fairly limited. Um, now we've already talked about the cabinet. And I want you to have a sense that Hamilton's own vision of the executive branch might be one in which the president was a sort of figurehead and Hamilton as the treasury secretary would assume the role of the second most important person in government, much like the chancellor of the exchequer is in the British government. Um, and so Hamilton as Washington's close assistant during the Revolutionary War, subtly tries to shift into a ministerial role. Now, John Adams is vice president. John Adams tends to think he ought to be second in command. 
Um, he very much liked the idea of using the Senate as an executive council that would advise the administration. And in, in the early days of the Senate, um, Adams as president of the Senate would give the Senate these long lectures on the particular duties of the Senate. And eventually the Senate got fed up with it and it sort of banned him from speaking, that you're not a member of the Senate, you don't have the privilege of the floor, which is a real rebuke. But again, there's the sense of where do, the boundaries between these branches, where do they exist and where do they not exist? Um, eventually the cabinet develops into a loyal executive working group and Washington uses them sort of like a board of officers to develop strategy, that they're gonna be people who suggest policy initiatives that write speeches for him, um, sort of like a political war room of sorts. But Washington is, is kind of, he's given a cabinet of people who don't agree with each other. They're regionally balanced. You have, you know, um, Hamilton uh, is a strong federalist, but you also have Jefferson as Secretary of State and Edmund Randolph as Attorney General. Um, and they sort of act to balance the power of Hamilton. So now I've implied that the presidency is not as strong as the modern presidency. And that's generally true. But the one place where Washington felt very strong in asserting federal power was in this area of foreign policy. Um, he believed that as the chief executive, that he had a high duty to kind of speak for the nation um, when he's kind of dealing abroad. And the major decision that needs to be made in the early 1790s concerns the unfolding of the French Revolution and the beginning of war between the British and the French. And so Washington has to decide, do I want a strong French policy or a strong British policy, or do I want to attempt to maintain some neutrality? Um, in 1793, the French Revolutionary government sends an ambassador um, named Citizen Guinée. And Washington, without, without asking Congress's opinion at all, proceeds to recognize Citizen Guinée and receive him um, as a guest in the White House, essentially then recognizing that this revolutionary France is the sovereign government. Um, he then issues a neutrality proclamation that Congress um, takes deep offense to. Um, and this begins one of the first major foreign policy debates in the press um, between newspaper um, anonymous editorials written by pacifists and Helvidius. Um, and it turns out that the pacifist is actually Madison and Helvidius is Hamilton. And they're arguing about whether or not Congress has the right to make foreign policy or whether it belongs to the president. Madison would say, because Congress is constitutionally given the power to declare war, then it also should have all of these other attributes. And, and Hamilton's arguing that the power is actually vested in the executive branch. So the, 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 the bitter battles that we see between Congress and Trump today over kind of presidential power um, in some ways are like hard baked into the constitution themselves. If you see Madison and Hamilton arguing about these. Um, these tensions reach a height in 1794 when George Washington says, yes, Chief Justice John Jay to negotiate a major treaty. There's nothing in the constitution that says the Chief Justice can't negotiate for you. Um, presumably today, the Chief Justice would refuse to do it um, on grounds that it wasn't the judicial function, but Jay, this doesn't bother Jay at all. Um, he goes and negotiates an unfavorable trade treaty with Great Britain that gives America some privileges, but it essentially gives Britain a lot more than they get from it. Um, the Senate approves the treaty, except for one clause, because the Senate is controlled by Federalists. But the House is really angry about this. And Madison in the House, kind of in an appropriations vote on putting the treaty into practice, actually asks George Washington to give them the negotiating papers so they can evaluate whether or not the treaty was a good idea. And George Washington refuses. He says, this is not your function. You know, like you're, you're here to appropriate, but you're not gonna assume the function of the Senate. And so then the House very narrowly approves appropriations for the treaty. So again, this is like, there's no precedent in these situations. And so these first cases are the cases that help to decide whether or not something is gonna be constitutional over the long term. Okay, that I hope gives you a sense of the role of Washington and precedent in creating kind of general rules about how you're gonna draw fine lines of balance between the executive and legislative branch. Now, 
there's a lot that we could talk about Hamilton's actual policy in creating a government. Um, and then Jefferson's actual mounting opposition to Hamilton. You can always pause these slides and look at them in advance of tomorrow's lecture. Um, but I really, um, I want to hold this for our discussion. So I'm skipping over it. What we do see, however, that's not in the actual text of the Constitution is the development of major political factions, one galvanizing around Hamilton um, and sees Jefferson's resistance to Washington's foreign policy and his plans as really a threat to the existence of the Republic. So here on, on this side, there's a, there's a Federalist cartoon of the all-seeing eye, probably Washington, and the eagle sort of snatching the Constitution back from Thomas Jefferson, who's attempting to burn it on the altar to Gallic despotism or the altar of French revolutionary tyranny, right? Um, well, here you could see a political cartoon of George Washington and the army sort of beginning to oppress the people in the name of power and military might and creating an American empire. Neither of these groups thought the other was legitimate. And it's amazing to me how fast they move into opposition to each other, right? And the textbook should give you a sense of how this culminates. I won't narrate this in great detail. I just want to give you a sense of the, the kind of the broad structure of it. But in 1796, there's the, the outbreak of, it's not a declared war, but there's a functional war with France in that France is trying to blockade Britain and prevent them from crushing their revolution. Um, and there have been the immigration of lots of radicals from Europe, especially from England, who are being persecuted. And so it seems that American politics is growing more radical. So the Federalists passed a series of laws, you can read about them in the textbook, that restricted immigration, naturalization. Um, recent immigrants, for instance, could only be naturalized after 14 years, which is clearly a plan designed to keep um, the Federalists in power for a long time. And then most controversially, they passed the Sedition Act, making it illegal to write false, scandalous, or malicious texts against the government to defame the government or to bring it into contempt. Now that strikes the Jeffersonians as a pretty direct law regarding the freedom of the press. The Federalists insist, however, that freedom of the press in the common law tradition had always meant that you could print whatever you wanted, but then you could be sued for a libel afterward. And again, there's this question of, does the common law bind the nation or not? The Constitution doesn't specifically create it, but is it just sort of implicit in the system that the common law is still prevailing? And the parties disagree about this. The Federalists bring 15 indictments and 10 convictions under the Sedition Act, including prominent Jeffersonian newspapermen and one rabble-rousing Jeffersonian representatives whom you see here with the tongs, Matthew Lyon. Um, this is actually a, a scene from the floor of the U.S. House where the Federalist Oliver Grimswald sort of is insulting Matthew Lyon and Matthew Lyon picks up tongs from the fire and he's literally chasing him around the well of the, the U.S. House and Griswold is defending himself with his cane. So um, Matthew Lyon's newspaper, uh, the Vermont Gazette, um, actually is censored at this point by the federal government. And Matthew Lyon is put in jail for a violation of the Sedition Act, even though he's a, he's a member of the House. And this, in my mind, goes too far. I mean, whatever the deb debates about freedom of speech are, it's pretty clear to me that freedom of speech would have essentially, if it meant anything, freedom of members of Congress to engage in dissent and debate about the government. So this actually occasions a profound response by the Jeffersonians. And you see this, the full articulation here of a constitutional theory, nowhere found in the constitution itself, but designed as a sort of strategy, as a way to sort of defend the kind of 
the 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 Whiggish version of constitutionalism, and um, in a nutshell, there were two legislatures in 1798 that were still controlled by friends of Jefferson, Virginia and Kentucky. So in 1798, Madison drafts a set of objections to the Alien and Sedition Acts, which are then resolved by the Virginia legislature, and Jefferson does the same thing for Kentucky. As a political strategy, it's a pretty good strategy because um, if Jefferson or Madison themselves say these things, it's possible that they will be held in contempt and they will be in prison for violating the Sedition Act. Um, but subsequent Americans insisted that there was something else going on here. And this in fact was what Jefferson and Madison articulated. They insisted that the federal government itself was a creature of the people of the states and that it had been created by compact for the express purposes of protecting liberty. So if you read the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions carefully, you'll see that they believe that the scope of federal power should be strictly limited by the text of the First Amendment that the federal government couldn't be trusted to set the limits on its own power. And so Virginia and Kentucky themselves believe that the states should have the ability to kind of police the national government and set limits on the power of the states. Um, that the, Fed, that the, the, the federal union then wasn't a full-blown nation, but it was a compact between the states. And if the states collectively wanted to argue that this was what the contact had meant, then it should be respected as such. Now, there are technical differences between these approaches that could get quite messy. Um, Madison said that the rightful remedy was the remedy of interposition, in which the power of the federal government would be arrested by states who would intervene. Um, it's not clear to me that that intervention would be forceful. It might simply be rhetorical. And Jefferson said, infamously or famously, depending on your point of view, that the state legislature of Kentucky could declare an act like the Sedition Act null, void, and of no force, that they would, in a word, nullify the federal law. Now, it's questionable what he meant by this, right? In the march up to the Civil War, South Carolina would later use this doctrine to assert that South Carolina could nullify federal tax laws that they didn't like. It's not clear to me that that's what Jefferson is saying. But Jefferson does seem to be suggesting that just like kind of Lord Cook in the English era had declared an act of parliament to be silly and null void and of no force, perhaps Kentucky would have the right to declare something unconstitutional. Not that its word would be final, but it was appropriate for its states to declare that the law was not in fact a law because it was violative of the constitution. And then this strikes us back to the question we were discussing earlier this week. Well, then what's the remedy? And what role do the people have? And this is a debate that's gonna to have to be clearly addressed in the sector of political debate. And so the election of 1800 um, becomes in some ways a forum on the constitutionality of the Alien and Sedition Act. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. That's more than enough minutes for our um, kind of supplemental lecture this week. And this should set us up really nicely to talk about the um, Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian constitutionalism and about John Marshall and the Marshall Court and how the Marshall Court attempts to solve this question of constitutional meaning through the judicial tribunal. Okay, I hope you've got a great day and I look forward to our conversations.